Thank you all very much. We'll keep uh, talking in English for this next panel. Thank you, Luigi Martino, for presenting the former one. And thank you also for being the organizer of this one with, uh, together with uh, Rocco Di Nicola. We're going to talk about the experiences of cybersecurity centers around the world, which is actually the natural prosecution of the former panel, which was about cyber diplomacy. So we're going to see how the experience in uh, the cyber centers around the world can uh, enrich uh, all our experiences uh, uh, and the knowledge about the cyber security. So please uh, uh, welcome uh, our next uh, uh, speakers, uh, Rocco Di Nicola, uh, Director c 3 t and uh, Deputy Director of the uh, Cyber Security National Lab. Please welcome uh, Madeline Carr, Director of Research Institute in, Cy in Science of Cyber Security the, uh, of the University College in London. Thank you, Dave, Dave Rowley, Commercial Director of, of Plexal, Lorca UK. Thank you, Feb Fabio Rugge, Head of uh, Center of Cyber Security at ISP in Italy. Leo Tabanski, Head of Research Programs at the Tel Aviv University in Israel. And uh, Fabio Rugge, um, and, and sorry, Rocco Calvi, Director of Digital Se Security Research, Research Center, TIEUAE. Welcome, everybody. And uh, so we're going to have another 55 minutes uh, of uh, uh, talk about, uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, cybersecurity centers uh, around the world. Please, uh, I, I will leave the word uh, for first to Rocco De Nicola. Thank you, Rocco. Uh, th thank you, Raffaele. So good morning, everybody. I mean, we around the world, uh, how we will talk, we'll start talking about Tuscany. So just something very, very remote for uh, for most of you. But first, I would like to to say something about how we started with Luigi. Why why we thought of this panel with Luigi? We had been trying to do some kind of political action to try to convince the Italian government to to set up a national laboratory for cybersecurity, because um, as I was saying in one of my question to uh, earlier this morning to, to the panelists, uh, it is two years or three years that they are discussing in Italy about setting up uh, some initiative uh, for a national lab for, for cybersecurity or even for other kind of things, for uh, the, the possibility of setting up centers where we could find a way of getting together uh, uh, private companies, uh, public companies, uh, um, governmental uh, institutions, and so on. But we are discussing about it a lot. And, uh, uh, well, up to now, nothing has happened. And so with Luigi, we wrote a couple of papers trying to, to see what is happening in other, in other parts of the world. And then we said, oh, why don't we call also some of these people that are doing these things uh, around the, the world to, uh, to tell us what they are doing, how they are working, so maybe we can, we can learn from that. But uh, then, then, I mean, this would have been just introduction. Then I was asked also to be a panelist, to talk about what? About a very small thing, that we think could be a seed anyway. So what we did in um, uh, in Tuscany, we managed uh, with the contribution of Tuscany region to set up an agreement. Uh, uh, is it possible to for me to to uh, okay to uh, I want to okay thank you. I want just to show a couple of slides. Uh, yes, I think this is it. Can you see my slides? Nobody answers. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, uh, okay, okay, I see why. Screen. Now, yes, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Nice screen. View full screen. Uh, full screen. So this is what I what we did in some sense. This C cube T. Uh, Centro di Competenza Cyber Security Toscano, where we put together the main Tuscan universities, 
Regione Toscana and CNR, which is the Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca and National Institution, and put together our efforts. Our efforts meaning what? I mean, in, there is no very big group here in, uh, in Tuscany in cybersecurity, but together we really can, can worry about a, a lot of things. And in, in such a way that we could um, kind of um, show ourselves toward the, uh, the companies, toward the institution as, as one, one body. And so now we have expertise on um, critical infrastructure, data protection, defense, law enforcement, supply chain, and so on. And, uh, and then together with Regione Toscana, and uh, this will be my only last uh, other slide, we have set up a number of projects for the moment for about assessing cybersecurity readiness, uh, an observatory for the, the challenges and the uh, and the availability of competencies in cybersecurity in Tuscany. Uh, 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 we are producing a number of material in order to uh, make people aware of the issue of cybersecurity from uh, a very sort of uh, for ordinary people in some sense, where we talk about cyber hygiene, for example. And another initiative is uh, the um, creation of cyber ranges. We, we, are, we, have the, we have defined some cyber ranges, which then we can uh, give to the companies, uh, Tuscan company, both to simulate their networks and to see their, uh, uh, the attack they could, uh, they could have, but also in order for, for training purposes. And we have also a team of uh, cyber defenders which we, with which we, we contribute, contribute to the cyber challenge uh, .it organized by the, the National uh, Laboratory. And what we are doing now, also, we have been contacted by some companies operating in Tuscan, not a Tuscan company, like uh, KPMG, VAR Group, Thales, and the idea is to try and set up, together with, with them and Tuscany region, um, a P public private partnership. And we hope, really, we, we, would like, we could be a stimulus for the setting up of the uh, the, the national the national center for for cyber security so i stop here i'm really eager to to hear from the others what they are doing more at the national level rather than at the small regional level thank you very much thank you very much Rocco de nicola deputy director of security national lab now uh, the microphone goes to Madeline Carr, director at the Research Institute in, in Science of Cybersecurity at the University College in London. Welcome, Madeline Carr. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's it's great to be here and such an interesting session for for me and for those of us who uh, who run a center. Um, I guess uh, a couple of things that the institute that I am the director of the risks or the research center for socio-technical cybersecurity uh, has been around for a, for a while now. It was initiated in 2013 um, and I took over as director in 2018. The, the um, center is jointly funded in the UK by our national cybersecurity center, which is that branch of uh, our, our intelligence community that looks after cybersecurity, and also by our National Research Council. Um, there are actually four institutes like mine. The, the one that I direct is, is specifically focused on these human and organizational factors of cybersecurity, um, but there are, there's one that looks at um, critical infrastructure, one that looks at hardware, and one that looks at software. Um, so. Um, and we work closely together. Uh, really, in in risks, we bring together. So it's it's headquartered at my university because I'm the director, but it's a national uh, center, and we bring together a really diverse uh, range of disciplines. We bring together uh, psychologists, economists, people who work on public policy, on on politics, on management, and we work always closely with the technical community. To, to explore um, a set of research objectives that we, we set at the strategic level 
uh, in the leadership team, these change over time, these um, research objectives, or we call them themes. But at the moment, we have linked these to the NCSC's um, National Cybersecurity Center's problem book, as they call it, which is a, um, <clears throat> a really helpful document that they have um, that they have uh, made publicly available that really outlines the the areas of research that they're most um, in need of and most interested in. So we align our research objectives with that problem book to ensure that we're really working closely together with them. At the moment, we have themes on, we have one on leadership and culture, for example, looking at the, the importance of, for example, um, uh, boards of private companies, decision-making on cybersecurity. Uh, we have one on cybercrime that looks at both the perpetrator and the um, and the victim perspective. Uh, we have one that looks at digital responsibility, as we call it, or um, you know what it means to be a human being in 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 the cybersecurity uh, landscape. And we've just introduced two uh, new ones. One which uh, one theme which will look at the international political dimensions of of cybersecurity. So very linked to the the previous panel, and another that will focus specifically on the difficulties of metrics and quantification of, of cybersecurity. Um, and now I think that the, we, we obviously we have great scholars in, in, in the UK working on all of these areas, but when I took over and the, the Institute had grown quite a lot, we recognized that we needed to be more innovative in actually in how we worked. So the, the, the great research was there, but the way the Institute actually was structured and functioned had, had needed some, um, some thinking through. Um, and really our goal is to have a high impact and, and to ensure that the really great research that, that our scholars are producing ends up in the hands of those people, those stakeholders who need it in the in the public, in the private sector, in civil society, and, th and that it ends up in their hands in a format that they find useful. Um, so, you know, I, I am an academic, but we all know what happens to, to our peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, you know, they they don't necessarily actually have the the, the or provide the kind of support that that we want to in um, in the public sector and in the private sector. So we knew we needed to change things up a little bit. <clears throat> um, now, one of the things that I'd observed over over the my years as an academic is that academics are increasingly asked to perform tasks that are outside of their core expertise. So things like um, publicity, events organization. Um, stakeholder management. And in some cases, for, for some of us, those are really enjoyable tasks and it allows us to use a wider set of skills. But in other cases, academics are really being asked to do things that they don't have the necessary expertise or experience to do really well. Um, in either in either case, whether whether academics enjoy those things or they don't, they always detract from our research time, which is what we're really short of and which is an academic's unique contribution. So within risks, to really maximize the research time of our scholars, we've put in place some support structures that we we um, we have seen already are making a real difference and and allowing us to really extract that maximum impact. <clears throat> Pardon me. And those are the things I wanted to tell you a little bit about today. So we fund research all over the UK, as I said, in all those different disciplines. And some of the things that we've we've changed now that have really been working for, for us well is that we've appointed a risk fellow uh, to every one of our research themes. And this allows us to kind of devolve the leadership um, from a, a small leadership team at the, at the top to allow these people who are specialists, for example, in cybercrime to really take on a, a leadership role in risks they're responsible for growing their community, for bringing up early career researchers um, who, you know, will, will for some succession planning, for and crucially for identifying the real research questions and the problems that that we need to act on as an as, as an institute. And having those people in place has made a huge difference to the scope and breadth and depth of the work that we can do. Um, we also focused very much over the last year or so on connecting to the policy community and in both directions. So 
as as researchers, we really need to understand what those policy problems are and uh, why you know policies might not be evolving in a way that makes sense to us as researchers. But we also wanted to make sure that our research in return was was really reaching those people in the policy community that that need it and that can make a difference. So we hired um, a woman, uh, Florence Gratrix, who, who does exactly that. She acts as a liaison between academics and the policy community in the UK. Um, she knows when there are uh, calls for evidence within the UK government. She knows when there are teams working on a particular issue. She knows what all of our researchers are doing. And she acts as a real, um, uh, what would you call, um, well, she's kind of a matchmaker in a sense. She puts together the researchers and, and the teams in, in HMG who, who need their, their research. And in fact, that's been so successful that we're expanding her time um, over the coming year. Um, and then just quickly, with, within each of those, those um, fellowships, we've built a team. So we have the academic who is usually an academic who's a fellow, though we have one from industry at the moment. We partner them with a lead from the National Cybersecurity Center who works specifically on that issue. We partner them with someone from um, government who is interested in that work. We partner them with someone from industry who has specific expertise and interest in that. And we, we partner them with someone from our advisory board. So we end up with a kind of cluster, a mini team uh, of people working on that particular issue already with good stakeholder representation. Next year or this coming year, one of our, our big goals is to expand more, to connect more with internationally with other like-minded centers. So this panel couldn't have, have come at a better time for us. Um, leave it there and, and really looking forward to hearing from everyone else and, and hopefully some questions at the end. Thank you very much again, uh, Madeline Carr. Uh, uh, I hope there will be some questions at the end of uh, our panel. Now, um, I call to the microphone uh, uh, Roberto Calvi, Director in of the Digital Security Research Center of the Technology Innovation Institute uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Thank you very much. Thank so you. My name is, Welcome. Thank you. My name is Rocco Kelvi. Uh, I work at TII. So TII aims to be a leading global research center dedicated to pushing the frontiers of knowledge. Our teams of scientists, uh, researchers, engineers work in an open, flexible, agile environment to deliver discovery, science, and also transform technologies that will not just prepare us for the future, but also create it. Uh, working together, we are committed to inspiring innovation for a better tomorrow. Uh, who we are, we are a publicly funded research institution based in the UAE, a global hub uh, for innovation. We report into the Abu Dhabi Advanced Technology Research Council, also known as ATRC. Uh, our purpose is to um, exist to help create a better world by pioneering the most advanced disruptive technological innovation designed to solve society's greatest challenges. Uh, what we do, we bring together top tier talent from across the globe to research and develop disruptive technology innovation for to benefit science, society, and also the economy for the environment. We collaborate across multiple um, disciplines with multiple partners for multiple clients. Uh, we create and share cutting edge knowledge to shape the future for, for the better. Uh, our main objectives are to attract the brightest scientific minds, to help society overcome its greatest hurdles, and to become a world leader in research and development uh, institution. So our research areas at TII is quantum research, uh, autonomous robotics, uh, cryptography, advanced materials, digital security research center, which I'm uh, leading, directed energy and also secure systems. So now I'll go into a little bit on my center. So Digital Security Research Center is attempting to advance beyond the cutting edge commercial security tools out there. We want to develop new automated tools that can automatically identify nested weaknesses in software and add, and add defenses to mitigate cyber attacks at speed and also scale. 
So our problem statement is the scarcity of talent, the cost of current security tools, the lack of intelligent uh, tools, the amount of vulnerable systems out there, especially with the explosion of IoT devices that are currently happening. So for us to achieve this, we're mainly focusing in what could be the next generation automated tools around analyzing software, identifying flaws, and also correcting them. Uh, so we mainly want to help uh, development teams and also security teams to really vet and understand um, software uh, with source code and without source code. So our main um, research areas that we're focusing on as a center is automated binary analysis. So this involves such as symbolic execution, SMT solvers, uh, coverage guided fuzzing. Uh, we're also doing some machine learning. Uh, emulation, looking at hypervisors too, to speed up the process of automatic evaluation of software and also instrumentation. Uh, next year, we aim to also automate vulnerability uh, evaluation too. Uh, this will help definitely dev teams out there to understand the current state of their software and to allow them to ship software more securely. And we also want to take it to the next level where um, uh, companies and the industry can take advantage of our research to also automatically come up with patches. Because uh, we do see within the industry um, that we've been working on uh, that a lot of uh, dev teams out there, they don't really understand the vulnerabilities that are being reported by security researchers around the world. They do get confused and they do actually introduce a lot of new vulnerabilities when they try to patch it. So we also want to automate not just discovery of vulnerabilities, but also uh, the patches for them. And we're also working um, with different partners around the world, um, especially from US, um, Italy, and also Florence, on how to um, automatically harden software before attackers can actually take advantage. So for the for in the future, we also want to come up with some um, scenarios that we can automatically play out, um, utilizing game through machine learning as well to know where uh, we should really focus our time on these types of capabilities. When you have a large environment with a lot of different software, which potentially um, cyber criminals could take advantage of. Thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, Rocco Calvi, and welcome to ETASEC 21. And uh, now we have Dave Rowley, Commercial Director of Plexal from UK. Welcome. Thanks, Raphael. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me along. Delighted to, to be part of such a prestigious panel. Um, so my name is David Rowley, uh, and I work for a company called Plexal. Um, and we are an innovation consultancy um, that runs both sort of virtual and physical innovation ecosystems um, across the UK. Um, I suppose the way that, that we look at the services that we provide is very much focused on, on government-led innovation. Um, and this sort of manifests itself in four key areas. So we have challenge programs where we work with various stakeholders to identify what the big challenges are, or potentially missions, as they are sometimes um, described as, and bring together a consortium to co-create solutions um, for those significant challenges that, that are being faced. And, and there are a number of those within cybersecurity that we'll go into. Um, we also run a number of growth programs where we support specific startups or scale-ups um, in their in their growth within cybersecurity, um, and then we we run a number of, I suppose, um, areas of of sort of research um, where we help to, rather than academic research, it's very much focused on helping join up, find the most promising cyber companies um, from across the world, and match them up with um, companies that that need those solutions. Uh, and then finally, and very relevant to uh, to this session. Um, is very much focused around this ecosystem management and ecosystem development piece. So I suppose um, what we're most famous for is um, the Lorca program. So three years ago, um, we were awarded the um, London Office for Rapid Cybersecurity Advancement contract by the UK government. Now, this was a core part of the 
UK cybersecurity strategy, the five-year strategy um, that ran from 2016 to 2021, um, and a new cybersecurity strategy will be getting announced this year. But this was very much a key enabler for that. It was a 13 and a half million pound program um, over three years, um, and very much focused on, I suppose, delivering two things. So one, prosperity, um, and two, security for uh, the UK citizens um, in this sort of increasingly digital world. Um, now, we sort of have worked in alignment with a number of other programs within within the UK. And as Madeline was mentioning there, we've worked very closely with the NCSC and their accelerator program. Um, and whilst the companies that were going through that program were very much focused on sort of national security, the Lorca program is very much focused around the growth agenda and really working with enterprise and industry um, to facilitate growth in, in the digital space and enabling that growth through, um, I suppose, securing um, those te that technology. Um, I suppose the key thing that we really look to do and, and that sort of sets us apart is bringing together the need, the industry need, um, and combining that with the, uh, you know, a set of really exciting startups and scale-ups, both within the UK and, and internationally as well, um, to solve for the most pressing and challenging uh, challenges that, that the world is, is seeing at the moment. Now, in terms of how we look at our success, it's very much focused around generating jobs, um, generating investment for the companies that are on the program, um, supporting them in, in being able to generate revenue, and then also helping them to win contracts and demonstrate their capability through proof of concepts um, to the uh, to the um, to the the, the 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 ecosystem that we are working with. Now, I suppose the the, the key thing to to know in terms of where we are three years on, um, seventy two companies have come through the Lorca program. Now, we're very much post revenue uh, companies, so focused on on more, I suppose, scaling businesses rather than the early stage startups. Um, these businesses have raised over 170 million pounds now in investment. Um, they're on track to create 875, 865 jobs um, and have generated in excess of 38 million pounds in revenue. So we're very much seen as a, um, a leader in, in the sort of the, the accelerator um, space within, within the UK. Um, and I suppose that one of the areas that we're looking to, to to expand on and really to sort of, I suppose, extend our capabilities into is supporting ecosystems across the world and also across the UK. So we're expanding our regional footprint in the UK um, into Cheltenham and Manchester and, and working very closely with other regions um, in terms of um, helping them to establish their own cybersecurity innovation hubs and making sure that there is a strategic alignment across the country. And then we also work very closely with ecosystems within Tel Aviv, New York, Australia, um, Canada, and also a, a, a not-for-profit called Global Epic as well, which is a, an excellent organization that are looking, again, to establish best practice in the ecosystem development of, of, for cybersecurity across the world. Um, and I suppose that we very much see our future in, in terms of sharing our, 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 I suppose, our learnings to date um, and expanding the programs that we deliver and making sure that we're helping to solve for the biggest challenges that are facing uh, the world at the moment in terms of cybersecurity, of which there are, there, there are a number, sadly, and, and we can you know, see that every time that we open open the paper. So I think that, you know, in terms of looking forward, it is very much that, you know, sharing expertise, sharing knowledge, really engaging with all of the key stakeholder groups. And it's fantastic to hear from Madeline on here. And I think this whole area of commercializing and aligning research, um, reaching out into understanding what are the what are the needs of large enterprise, engaging with the technology vendors and these hyperscalers to really help to align their capabilities to support scale with the most promising cyber businesses uh, across the world and then also engaging effectively with the investment community and ensuring that with some of the cyber businesses that are very different to some of the other technology domains where you need that long runway of funding up front potentially 
uh, making sure that that is well understood and there is a good runway of funding. Um, but with that, I think that's probably my, my time out. So looking, looking forward to uh, answering some questions in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave Rowley. And now it's the turn of Fabio Ruggia, which, is, which leads the Center of Cybersecurity at ISPI Italy, one of our main research organizations in Italy. Welcome, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you, Raffaele. And, and it's really a pleasure being here. It's not my first uh, ITASAC, uh, not my first radio, as they say. And it's always a pleasure uh, to be here. ITASAC, of course, is the main event in Italy when it comes to bringing together stakeholders um, from the uh, academia and the industry to try and make a sense of what's going on, really. Uh, and it's also a pleasure to be here with many friends, uh, Dior, uh, that contributed already to the work of the Institute uh, um, of ESP, uh, Madeline Carr, that was uh, with us uh, uh, some time ago. So it, it's really a pleasure. We created in 2017 the um, Italian Institute Center for Political uh, International Political Studies uh, uh, on Cybersecurity. We created it together with uh, Leonardo that supported uh, uh, the center at, at, the, at the beginning of our work. Uh, we basically have, I would say, two main objectives, two main ambitions. Uh, the first one is that of contributing to the international debate uh, um, and analyzing uh, 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 the, the, the new political reality that is brought uh, by uh, the emergence of cyberspace. Uh, the, the, ben the basic idea, the, the starting point, if you will, of our consideration is that um, cyber power is an essential component of sovereignty in the 21st century. Uh, that the uh, emergence of cyberspace uh, created, in fact, uh, uh, a new political space, uh, a new political reality. The, the cyberspace uh, creates the structural element of this reality, which has not been yet uh, sufficiently in investigated. Uh, our idea at ISP is that uh, we are in the midst of a, a, one of the greatest uh, unprecedented uh, uh, revolution in the history of humankind, which is, of course, the cyber revolution, the cyber uh, age. And, uh, and that we, uh, and that this is actually not really a, a only a technological issue, of course. It's, it's a really a cultural and political issues that needs to be investigated. And therefore, uh, together with mounting operational capabilities, uh, uh, every state also needs to develop skills and tools, uh, diplomatic tools, um, to, to manage the, uh, the growing complexity uh, that is brought by cyberspace, uh, uh, by this domain of ambiguity uh, that, needs to be, that needs to be better understood. Uh, so, once again, our ambition is that of contributing to that, to that debate, um, uh, because that debate, in our opinion, is uh, essential at least uh, at three levels. The first one, of course, is that of making sure that uh, we are able to uh, mount uh, a, um, an efficient uh, uh, posture in, in the cyber domain, and that we are able to uh, align uh, our cyber posture uh, with a general deterrence and defense posture. Uh, these, of course, are issues that we follow very closely in NATO. Uh, these, of course, are issues that are essential when you think that um, uh, the, the uh, emerging uh, great power competition or the, if you will, re-emergence of great power competition finds uh, in the cyber domain um, a, a, a preferred stage. Um, and, and therefore, it is really essential to make sure that uh, in military terms, uh, we are able to make sure that we are able to align the, the posture in the cyber domain, make it efficient, and then that we are able to align it to the general deterrence and defense posture. And this, of course, with the idea of making sure that we are able to bring stability uh, to, the inter to international relations. The second level, of course, uh, is that this posture needs to be coherent uh, with our values. Uh, the cyber domain uh, is, of course, the neural system that connects the industrial, economic, financial, cultural, political, um, uh, technological dimensions. Um, uh, therefore, uh, we need to make sure that this uh, uh, 
uh, posture is coherent, the posture that we have in cyberspace is coherent with our values. Yeah? And this is actually very, very important, not only because the foundation, uh, our foundation lies in, 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 the, in the rule of law, in, in the respect of, of privacy and the body of, of principles that, that make our democracies and our open, open democracies, um, but also because, um, once again, uh, entanglement of cyberspace is such that uh, uh, our freedom will depend more and more on how secure and free uh, is, is the internet that we, that we have, especially in the midst of this decoupling uh, of the IT supply chain and on the balkanization of the global internet in many sub-regional sets. Um, a third level uh, the, in which we want to contribute to the international debate uh, is, is that of mitigating the risk of cross-domain escalation, of course, which is, of course, uh, a, a huge issue in, in, uh, in international relations because we always need to remember that uh, what happens in cyberspace doesn't stay in cyberspace. Yeah? Uh, entanglement is such that uh, uh, what happens in the cyber domain is actually able to have an impact at the international strategic level, in nuclear deterrence, for instance. Yeah? Uh, just look at the uh, nuclear posture review of the United States, and you will see that cross-domain escalation is certainly one main concern. Um, and, and therefore, uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, we understand how to manage the new doctrine of persistent engagement in cyberspace, the idea that uh, a militarization is underway, the idea that we need to draw red lines, the idea that we need to strengthen deterrence. So, so all these all these issues. And of course, how do we do that in ISP? We do it by trying to connect and, and, and create bridges across the world. And I, I was mentioning uh, uh, Madeleine Carr and Lyota Bonsky contributed directly to our work, but also, you know, um, uh, our two last uh, annual report uh, were joint products uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Brookings institutions. Uh, uh, finally, I was saying that we have two ambitions uh, at ESP. The first one is that of contributing to an international debate, but the second one is also to create awareness, uh, steer the debate at the national level. Uh, uh, ESP was born uh, uh, to give a sense of the world uh, to the uh, companies and industries uh, in Lombardy uh, 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 at the beginning of the century. We still have this ambition of providing uh, a service to our country to, pro to create awareness, to steer the debate, to, if possible, even educate, if that is not uh, too much to say. Um, so we, we, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, Rocco was mentioning before the National Laboratory for Cybersecurity, which we have been discussing in Italy for the last two years. The idea there is that uh, unless you are able to create awareness, to bring together uh, in the first session, uh, uh, um, uh, Laura Carpini and others were discussing multi-stakeholder diplomacy, PPP. Now, the, the idea is that you need to create that environment in, of interaction, of discussion, of, uh, uh, of comparing notes, so that we are able to uh, um, uh, uh, enhance the national resilience, and enhance the national awareness, uh, uh, and to that effort, uh, ESP would be really, really happy to, to contribute uh, uh, to a possible national laboratory for cyberspace, which certainly would, uh, would uh, fill a gap uh, 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 at the national level. Uh, uh, filling the gap, uh, and I close with this, uh, you know, um, uh, we, we normally say that uh, cybersecurity uh, and the, the, the stability of cyberspace uh, uh, brings up the issue of uh, governance gap. Now, governance gap is the name that we give uh, uh, to the time that we uh, uh, need to cope with institutional change. Uh, so the, the general idea that is that we need to push ahead uh, institutional change and make sure that uh, our democracies are able to cope with the challenges that more, most affect uh, our security and freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio Ruggia from uh, ISPI in Italy. And uh, now the stage, we, we will say the stage is for uh, Lior Tomanski from the Tel Aviv University. Welcome, Lior. 
Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, hello, Fabio. Hello, Luigi. Thank you for having me. As you kind of mentioned, we worked before. I will uh, uh, talk uh, about the uh, uh, experience in the last 10 years that we had, uh, uh, not in the, my personal capacity, but as the uh, uh, working in the Cyber Research Center. Uh, now, Tel Aviv University is Israel's uh, largest, the most comprehensive. And the Center for Research of Cyber was established in 2014, following the uh, government initiative in 2010 to uh, design a strategy for cyber security. Now, Professor uh, Isaac Benizel leads the center, and the um, idea of the center was to foster interdisciplinary research because there is expertise in all related fields, but they uh, often do not uh, meet each other. I'm a political scientist. I have a, a lot of uh, 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 seen a lot of uh, difficulties in bridging these interdisciplinary gaps, and this will continue. So to do that, we have a, a fund to award the uh, grants. Also, before the uh, center was established, and uh, until today, we run a lot of outreach activities. Uh, the Cyber Week conference is the largest one. It's uh, been running for 10 years now. Uh, now, uh, we have uh, funded 97 projects by now, uh, selected by uh, typical academic criteria. The government funds part of the work uh, and require us to bring uh, external matching but we get the academic freedom, so to speak, which is so important for the universities, to fund whatever the universities uh, uh, want to do. This was the design, this was the strategy, and I think that this is uh, uh, coming close to an end, and I'll explain why, and I hope it will inform some of your uh, discussions as well. Uh, the research that university performs is fundamental research. They are not interested, uh, the faculty are usually not very interested in solving um, current problems, so to speak. Of course, research is fundamental, so there is a big tension all the time between the work that we uh, fund and what other stakeholders expect or want to do. For example, the Americans, when they come to visit, uh, they are always surprised that we are not uh, doing uh, a workforce training, for example. The solving the workforce shortage is not seen as a mission for the university by the university leadership here, uh, in contrast with the American experience. Now, uh, this tension between uh, what happens in the real world and uh, what the researchers want to do is continuing. We, of course, are very much involved with the <coughs> what is going on through our outreach activities, through our range of uh, partners, and of course through the government. And what we see uh, that um, uh, in recent few years there's a, a growing uh, doubt. Do we need a university to do research on cybersecurity? And the reasons for that are, are twofold. First of all, uh, many scientists say, okay, cybersecurity is a, a, an applied issue. Go study physics, mathematics, psychology, economics, whatever you want, and then don't alter the basics, get the solid foundations. You will get the skills to tackle any practical problem. The second one is the, um, uh, the reality, I think, that there is no shortage of tools and knowledge uh, out there. We see it especially here from our perspective in the, um, uh, no, this is not uh, the right one. We see a lot of uh, uh, inflow in investments in uh, R&D, corporate R&D performed by multinationals in Israel, a lot of funding for startups. And when I talk to people in the industry, uh, in banking, in retail, whatever, they don't uh, think that the shortage of tools or the shortage of fundamental approaches is the problem. The, uh, on the contrary. So a lot of people, including the government, think that uh, some of the uh, need to fund fundamental research as cybersecurity is, is uh, obsolete. The market has matured. The uh, 
other sectors which are not uh, fundamental research are doing a lot of work. So we expect that the independent uh, free money to do research will uh, cease. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the uh, demand for things like uh, almost like professional services advisory will continue to grow. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, junction at which we see. So it's interesting to hear that uh, um, after all these years that we've seen a lot of uh, uh, intention in different Italian uh, uh, areas to establish some sort of uh, what you call national laboratory for cyber. And we have cooperated with uh, 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 Professor Colegiani and with Dr. Martin and with, uh, um, of course, with Fabio Lispi and so on. It, it's interesting to see that there's still no uh, uh, such uh, decision have been made with supported funding and everything. Uh, uh, because from our perspective, it looks like it's uh, already a, a bit too late. The, the urgency to do something like this seems uh, um, uh, uh, different now. Like in the UK, the national, our equivalent of the National Cybersecurity Center, they have specific uh, issues. They can procure uh, R&D services uh, in uh, universities and corporate labs and government labs and so on. So uh, they don't see it as a fundamental issue. Uh, another thing that we started to do in response to the demand is uh, executive education for uh, managers, not from technical area. Uh, in the, in terms of uh, bringing uh, uh, exposure and the maturity from experienced practitioners and academics to the people who are not IT practitioners. They are, in our perspective, the main uh, leaders of change, and uh, they are the most confused. They have a lot of responsibility, but they don't need to understand the technicalities. On the other hand, the IT departments, they uh, are not usually very much aligned with business. Now, I will not uh, discuss the national policy and security policy, which is another different area, uh, and it's a mess, of course, but uh, uh, the university, again, is uh, not in the first, uh, in the top uh, uh, list of organizations who will uh, be considered to solve the uh, political and policy problems of defense and so on. So um, I think uh, this is uh, uh, enough for this uh, talk, and it's uh, uh, very interesting to hear what uh, your perspectives are on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lior Tomanski from the Tel Aviv uh, University. And now uh, I've been informed that uh, Rocco De Nicola might have some uh, final remarks uh, on this really, really interesting panel. And so, Rocco De Nicola. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Raffaele, and thank you to, to all speakers. I mean, uh, I've really learned a lot. I mean, uh, and uh, I don't know whether to take up the provocation of of Lior Tabanski about uh, universities being a sort of uh, not necessary for for cybersecurity. I don't know whether I understood well the messages, but I think that I mean, research is any way fundamental. Otherwise, other people will do research instead of us, and we will not be able to understand better, uh, to understand what's going on. And uh, I mean, if we want great mind to be uh, behind uh, the uh, cybersecurity, we need to to fund also also universities. And I'm sure that in the United States they co they they are continuing to to do so. And I think will be really bad for Europe and for uh, uh, for Italy to, to, to give up uh, on this. I do think that having um, a context in which we together, governmental organization, uh, universities, other research center, uh, researchers from other research centers, private company do collaborate, I think is really very, very, is very, very important. I mean, as the, um, um, the representative of you this morning, this, this morning was saying, the, the, the attacker, I mean, they do a lot of things together. You know? they, and, and they exchange information and they attack the weakest point. So the point is that we have really to coalesce and research centers, I mean, national research centers should be done. I mean, 
physicists do it. I mean, they have CERN physicists, no? And because they, I mean, and that that's seen as a real challenge. But I think also cybersecurity is a, is a real challenge, and is going to be to be really important that we are, we are experiencing it now for. I mean, for the next, uh, it's not just technology. I mean, it, there is a lot of research yet to be done. The mix of AI and cybersecurity, for example, defending AI and using AI for defending cybersecurity. This kind of thing can be done only in very large collaborative research centers. Uh, this is the only thing I want to, I want to say. I mean, of course, it's not, a, it's not a conclusion to this debate. If somebody else wants to add something, I hope Raffaele will give him the, the opportunity to, to say it. Otherwise, I just Thank you anyway very much. I, I, I really learned a lot uh, from this uh, this panel. <laughs> if, if I may just uh, uh, clarify, uh, I, I obviously work in the university and I think that universities are essential. What am I saying yeah, is... I'm sorry, can you just uh, turn on uh, your camera for the sake of our audience uh, in streaming, please? Sorry. Thank you very much. So I said, of course, I believe universities are essential and the technology part is a minor part of the issue. What I was describing is the uh, feedback we get from the uh, those who we ask for funding. They say, okay, universities want to do research, fine, let the universities fund it, Horizon 2020, whatever. Don't come asking us, okay? That's what they're saying. Okay. Uh, so, so that's the point. <laughs> because you, you cannot have it both ways. You cannot have that cybersecurity is thriving and there is uh, money flowing in and the expenditure is rising. On the other hand, saying that uh, you need more for fundamental research. That's, that's the uh, tension that we sense and I suspect it will grow. Okay. Thank you. I think we should correspond, but privately maybe. I mean, we, we should not <laughs> bother the others. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for everyone. Uh, I think this is really the reason why we miss so much to meet in person uh, for this kind of events, because we always have the occasion to just go outside the room, uh, grab a coffee, and actually make the improvements in our uh, comprehension of all the general scheme from uh, each point of view. I'm really sorry, but I'm afraid that we're really too late because later we have, uh, as you know, from uh, our uh, program, uh, Nunzia Ciardi, which is director from uh, Polizia Postale in Italy, and it's a really uh, weighted uh, uh, speech. So we, are, we have also some technical uh, needs that uh, we must address. So uh, for now, I'm really sorry. I, I can't take que uh, further questions. Of course, I remember to everyone that we're going to uh, use Slack uh, for conversation and for uh, questions uh, for uh, today's speakers. I will. Uh, re uh, I, I, I want to thank you again, Rocco Calvi, Madeline Carr, Rocco De Nicola, Dave Rowley, Fabio Rugge, and Lior Tabanski for this really interesting speech. And uh, we are going to have uh, a four minutes. Uh,